we say welcome to you, to Pastor Scorner. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you at this time. We thank God for you taking time to be with us so that as we share from the Word of God, we can grow in our knowledge, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we can have a better understanding of who Jesus is as he reveals himself to us through the Word. This morning, I have with me two distinguished men of God, and of course, they are distinguished because they are part of a vocation that is second to none. And so I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves, and after they are finished, Pastor Pancho would pray for us. Once again, we are here on Pastor's um, Corner. I'm, I'm saying a uh, uh, bless. Um, Greetings to everyone out there, um, the viewers, um, Pastor Palmer from the um, South Central um, District, Windsor Forest to be um, exact. And I'm just blessed to be here to share the Word of God with you as we dialogue, as we discuss, as we edify our minds in the Word of God. Thank you. Okay, a pleasant uh, good day to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be with you uh, this morning. Of course, my name is Marlon Pancho. I'm the pastor of the Grenadines district, uh, including the churches of Dover, Hillsborough, Leicester, and of course, Peter Matnick. So I'm happy to join you this morning and look forward to a wonderful time in sharing the word of God. So at this time, we're just going to have a word of prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed day that you have given unto us as we begin another episode of the Pastor's Corner. We pray for your blessing that you'd guide us in our discussion, that you'd guide us in our study, that your name will be honored and praised is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, and Pastor Panchu said that he is the pastor of the Grenadines, and that is Karaku and Pitimatnik pastor. Yes, correct. All right. So you came down with the boat or you came down with the plane? Uh, well, the boat. You came down yes, with the boat. Yes, so I how enjoyed... was the ride? Just in case we were thinking about going to Karaku, how was the ride? Uh, it was a pleasant ride coming down. Um, three hours of it. Okay. You know, but we give God the thanks. We are here safely, and we thank him again for another trip. All right, so you didn't, you didn't come down fast, you came down slow. Yes, we take the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very nice. And we have Pastor Palmer who just finished a series in his church, Pastor Horsey series. It was a, a blessed one. The word of God um, continued to, to be pro, um, proclaimed. And we did have an excellent time as the word go out and souls get a better knowledge and come to accept our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, and I also recognize that persons give their lives to Jesus Christ. Am I correct? Correct. Yes, so correct. All right. That's just the, 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 the whole idea about, about the multiplying effect of All the right. gospel. All right, wonderful. So you're, you're growing. You are growing not just in knowledge, but you're also growing in numbers Amen. by the grace of God. Amen. But this morning, our topic is building a thriving church. And that is an important topic for us to discuss. And uh, if you have not noticed, one thing that seems to be important in the lives of individuals is religion. Most persons are associated with some kind of religious thought or practice. And even if they are not directly involved, you would hear them saying, I am of this religion because that is where my mother and my grandmother and so on used to go. So even when it comes to lineage, they would say, well, my ancestors went there and that is where I associate myself, even if I do not find myself in that place on the day of worship. And so building a thriving church is an important subject area. Let me also say good morning to our online audience, our online viewers. We are so happy to see you, and we thank God for your presence today because we know that when you're here, you would not just keep it, but you are going to share it with somebody else. Let us get into the matter. How would you describe the body of Christ, or what is the definition of ecclesia? Let's get right to it. When we, when we look at the term body of Christ, we uh, should be on the path thinking of family. Mm -hmm. 
thinking of family because the, f the family of believers, okay. that's just, you know, the body of Christ. We are part of the, of the family of believers, mm -hmm. um, a special group of, of, of persons, which brings the, the idea to the next question, um, speaking about um, Ecclesia. Um, Ecclesia is not an, 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 an I could say, well, an English terminology, but reference to the Greek and that culture of the Greek. And so they had the reference of Ecclesia that speaks about a called out assembly. So, um, so body of, 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 of describe the body of Christ as believers, the Ecclesia is like the call out um, assembly. You know, um, just to read a text from First Peter 2 and verse 9, mm -hmm. it says there, but you are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and, and, and holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who will call you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay. So when we speak about Ecclesia, we're speaking about called out and from darkness into life. So, um, yes, you're in the world. The world of, we all in the world. And as the gospel has been preached, um, we have been called out from, from sinful practices um, that might affect us, or, or actually not might, affect us in our life. Mm -hmm. So we are called out from, from sin and it's, you know, like alcohol and drinking and adultery and fornication and false doctrine and all these things. So we be get be getting a clearer light as we call us from darkness into God's marvelous light. All right, very nice. One of the other aspects I want us to, to consider is the fact that when we consider the church, um, especially when we consider the, the word ecclesia, it takes beyond the, the church building. It's beyond the four walls of the church. It's beyond uh, our architectural, the architectural beauty of the physical building. And it's making reference to the believer who have given up the, the ways of the world, you know, given up the pleasures of the world, uh, as Pastor Palmer was making reference to, and have accepted the light of God's word. Mm -hmm. And so Ecclesia, again, when you consider the, the Greek uh, root of that word, if, um, usually they have the large councils, and whenever you have an important decision to be made, they will select a, a representation from that council. So like for example, they have a council of a thousand members. They might have a representation of a hundred out of that large council who will sit and make a decision on behalf of the council. And that's where that word literally comes from. So when you talk about the church of Christ, he's literally talking about the called out one. And I think that's important for us to understand as believers that God wants us to move beyond the building and the corners of the building and understand that all part in the kingdom of God is persons who are called out to show forth the praises of the one who have called us out of darkness, as Pastor Palmer said, into his light. All right, wonderful. And, and, and Pastor... Um, we could always um, even add, just to help us, Ecclesia, um, some, the word church, um, often used as, e as, as Ecclesia um, within the gospel, but um, you could say, well, church, because as a body of believers, we are church, but of course we are Ecclesia, we are called out um, into his marvelous light. Okay, so can you therefore say that there is a people before there is a building? Well, definitely. <laughs> I would agree with such a statement mm -hmm. because, you see, the power of the gospel and, and the power of salvation of our lives is what will us draw us, you know, um, to Christ and to be obedient to his word so that the child of God don't like the carnival because that doesn't appeal to them because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of light and not of darkness. Mm -hmm. um, they will not like um, going out there and drinking or using drugs or, you know, or, or all of those practices that is out there in the world because, as I said, it goes beyond the wall, and it's about us as individuals. We are called an individual. We have a responsibility to be representative, representatives of Christ. All right, yes. very nice. Our second question, what would you say is the real purpose of the church? And that's important because even today, persons are seeking to find their purpose. What's the purpose in this life? And so purpose is important. So what would you say is the real purpose mm -hmm. of the church. So we already established the called out ones. It's not about the, the building and the aesthetics. It's about the people, individuals who need salvation and those who are going to, to move. And so the question is, what would you say is the real purpose of the church? So when we, when we look at, at purpose as we building on that foundation, okay. when we look at purpose um, 
you, we are called out, as we, as we said. But if you call it from darkness, in, the, in, my, in Christ, into Christ's marvelous light, you now have to shine that light, mm -hmm. you know, back to the world that you, that, that you come from. So, so it means that you have to be, in the word of God, in, in, in Matthew, it speaks about the commission, right, in the book of Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, so I can just um, quickly turn, the, um, turn to it for you. Mm -hmm. As I point you to God's word, in Matthew chapter 28, okay. and it speaks about, and Jesus spoke unto them, saying, All authority has been given to me, mm -hmm. and if or not, go therefore, call out, and make disciples of, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy um, 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 Spirit. So we are called now to proclaim the gospel. We have a, we have a, a, a mission, we have a, we have a commission with a mission to proclaim the good news of salvation, because the church purpose is to be a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Until, but I'm keeping with the same context. Darkness, light, now we have to be a lighthouse unto them um, out there. So we have that, 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 that role um, to be a lighthouse out there. Just to read for you, there is a, a quote um, from a from, um, famous um, author, um, E.G. White, taken from the book Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Um, and it says here that the church is God's appointed agencies, agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to, to the world, purpose of the church. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world, his fullness and his sufficiency, purpose. The members of the church, does, um, members of the church those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light are to show forth his glory. Um, the church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church, um, as, as the reading is saying, and through um, the church, and sorry, and through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principal, principalities and mm -hmm. powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. Wonderful, wonderful. So if, if I could add anything to that, it's just to, to say because, of course, um, understanding the church, and I said we already gone, be, as you said, beyond the walls of the church. Mm -hmm. um, one have to find Christ. That's the purpose. If, if uh, uh, in summary, that if I come to church and I can't find Christ in that church, mm -hmm. the church has failed its purpose. Okay. Because it's a weakness, and and again, the word redemptive weakness mm -hmm. is that we who have been redeemed, mm -hmm. that when we come together, that colloid mm -hmm. body of persons come together, is a time when we have a wonderful time. A time where we find joy, where we get, find thanksgiving, where we find praise. Because it's hard for me to imagine being called out, being saved, and not being joyful. Okay. And so as a church, the purpose is really to lift up the one who has saved us. Excellent. And wherever we go and we find that the name of Jesus is being lifted up, there is great joy and there is great That's peace. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful. So we could, we could also safely say that the church is mission-oriented. So when I say mission, is is not just about going to foreign lands, but about in your local territory. We have Amen. a mission to accomplish. Amen. So it's not a church or a congregation or a group that sits down and does nothing. Mm -hmm. We must also be able to reach others for Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just um, permit me, um, pa um, Pastor, in linking the purpose, it makes reference to transformation. The church have a Christ transform us, but the church will, you know, will help us that aspect of being transformed as we spread the gospel of Christ. Okay, very nice. And when the children of Israel left Egypt, the purpose in, in moving around was to be an influence to the nation, not for them to influence the nations who influence the called out or those who mm -hmm. came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm but for God's people to influence the territories where they went. But of course, we saw differently. And uh, there are consequences when it happens the other way around. When the, the world, so to speak, influences the purpose-driven church, or what is supposed to be the purpose-driven church, then the, the church finds itself in a different place and position, both morally, spiritually, and otherwise. So it's really supposed to be the church influencing the world. Amen. True. Okay. Amen. Do you think it is possible for all Christians in the body of Christ to unite to achieve this purpose?
purpose. So you already established purpose in terms of the church. So do you believe that it's possible for all Christians in the body of Christ to unite to achieve this purpose? And we have text here from John, John 17, 11. So we're going to go there. And also verse 21. So let's go there and let's see what it says. It says, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. He says, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And verse 21 also says, That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. It almost feels like a tongue twister. <laughs> so unfold that for us. Well, definitely, I, I believe that we all can be one. Um, and of course, when we talk about Christianity here, um, it's, it's, it's only fair that for listeners and viewers to understand that we're not just talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church. Christianity in and of itself has I mean, a multitude of denominations, a multitude of, of various beliefs across uh, Christianity. And so one, once one consider that those who are believing of the Bible, who are believing in Christ, and yet have so many varying views and so many varying um, churches, and you consider the question once again, which asks, uh, is it possible for the body of Christ to unite to achieve this purpose? Um, I would say that yes, it's possible. Um, with God, all things are possible. But given what we have seen historically and even what we consider as to the various doctrines that are out there, I don't think um, that we're going to have that unity that Christ expects us to, to have. So, for example, um, when you consider that there are some Christian churches who disregard the seven-day Sabbath, there are some Christian churches who disregard the fact that when we die, that the body goes down into the grave and the bread goes up to Christ, as indicated by the scriptures, then it's hard to see that all of the Christian church is reconciling because there are those who go contrary to what God's word says. But at the same time, I believe that God has preserved um, his truth. Um, there is those who believe on that does said the Lord and who build their faith on that does said the Lord 100%. And so within the context of that, um, considering Christianity generally, um, I don't think that it will be achieved because there is an enemy of souls, and of course, that enemy goes in, he sows discord, he goes in, he sows false doctrine, he goes in and he blinds the mind of the people to the word of God. And for that reason, I don't think that it will happen before the coming of Christ. Okay, so can we then see that just as a team, whether secular or within the spiritual context, there are goals that you need to achieve, and if within the team, they have persons who have other goals that they want to achieve, then it's not possible for the team to be united because they have different objectives in mind, different goals that they want to achieve, and it's not the common goal that the team wants to achieve. Would you, would you say something like that? Uh, definitely, because one of the things that we, we observe is that Christ is the shepherd, mm -hmm. and we are the sheep. The sheep don't tell the shepherd what to do. Okay. The shepherd guides the sheep. Sure. And so if we say we believe in Christ, we'll obey Christ. If we say we believe in Christ, we'll obey the word of Christ as written in, in, in the Bible. Okay. And because there are persons who reject the word of God, but yet want to be called Christians, mm -hmm. then that's why we have so many different churches, mm -hmm. so many different organizations under the banner of Christianity. And so we have to be careful with that. Okay. Well, um, as Pastor... Um, Began he's speaking about the controversy, and we are in a controversy now, in a, in a great one, and conflict. So yes. unity um, to be maintained could be very, as was said, could be very challenging. Even from within someone's own, own local church, okay. you can have a lot of discord, even within one own local church. Mm -hmm. um, so we're speaking here both in terms of all Christians, and even from your own local church, because of, of this conflict that, 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 that we are in, in this controversy um, to, with God, 
all things are possible. But when men have their own ideas and, as you said, their own goals and what they want to achieve, um, then that could have a lot of um, 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 negative effects. Mm -hmm. Because some persons, um, they might think, look, my aim is, is to gain a lot of money. Mm -hmm. How can I have a church and, you know, and my aim is to gain money. So mm -hmm. their mindset is, 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 is unity, but unity for their own self. Or sometimes the, the doctrine may not be in harmony with, with the word of God. So you can have a lot of conflict arising there. Okay. So yes, in God it's possible, but human, human th humanly thinking, it could be a, 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 a real challenge. Okay. And I believe also when it comes to that whole word in here, in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. to unite, it has to be where the principles are lined up properly. So it can be a case where some persons are infringing on and trodden on principle, that principle that upholds or stands within the word of God, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So if there are Christians and Christian denominations who are infringing on and they are seeking to erode the word of God, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ, then it means that unity would be difficult in that sense because all principles and so must be matched up nicely so that we can have this cohesive nature existing within the body of Christ. All right, well spoken. Can you please provide some clarity on the passage in Matthew 16, 18, and 19? I believe this is where things get interesting because these are areas that we are accustomed to. Let me just say hello to a few of our friends online, Cassandra James saying good morning, and Rolf Ferguson, good morning, Denny Mitchell, Saying good morning, Hamilton, Kellen Charles from the UK saying good morning. And so we say hello, good morning to you. And please don't be shy. You can also share your views online so that we can see what you are thinking as we continue delving deeper and deeper under the subject area, the topic building a thriving church. So can you please provide some clarity on the passage in Matthew 16, 18, and 19? And I'll read it for you. And it says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19 says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Please clarify. It's a very powerful passage of scripture. And one that I've created over the years. Um, you see a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Because for example, if you look at Roman Catholicism. And, and of course the history of, of the priesthood there that it will tell you that it's built upon Peter. Mm -hmm. Because it seems that here in this passage of scripture, that Christ is saying to Peter that upon, upon him, that he will build his church. Mm -hmm. But when you have a closer understanding of the text and you look uh, to have a proper understanding of the text, there is two words that are being used here. One, that um, as it relates to Peter, being the small rock, and of course the next, which refer to Christ, who is, is actually the big rock. Okay. And again, that just to simplify it. And so what Christ was really saying, that Peter is a small rock, but he is the big rock. And he builds that church not upon Peter, but upon himself. So Peter, that small rock, builds upon Christ. Okay. Because mm -hmm. Christ is the rock. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this succession of Peter being as the, as I just say, the, the, the first priest in the sense, uh, is, is a wrong understanding of the passage of scripture. Because Christ didn't leave his church unto anybody else. Mm -hmm. But as he says, that he is the head of the church. And because he is the head of the church, everyone who come after, they said, no other foundation is laid. Okay. Except the one that he laid. And here he's saying that the church itself is so powerful, is so expansive, that the dynamism of the church is such that not even the gates of hell could stand up against it. Okay. So if we try to understand it in that way, one would understand that the power that is, is there in the church of God, that ecclesia that we talked about earlier, is so great that when we stand, demons in hell tremble. Mm. Why? Because we're not standing in our own power, but we are standing under the might and the power of King Jesus. And I think that here, the passage itself, makes clear 
that Christ is the rock. Mm -hmm. Not Peter, but Christ is that rock on which the church is built upon. All right. Wonderful, um, Pastor. Um, just to, to add something um, in terms of Peter and the rock, mm -hmm. the church is not, you know, on man as a sinner. It's on God. God is a, Christ is the foundation. Um, we have seen here that um, Peter um, eventually, eventually after that statement was made, what you just read, from mm -hmm. what Christ said to him, I would, upon this rock I build my church. Mm -hmm. Eventually, um, in the book of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 69 onwards, it makes reference um, that Peter, you know, I can, I can read verse 74 of Matthew 26. It says here, then he began to, that's Peter, mm -hmm. began to cross and so he saying, I do not know the man. Mm -hmm. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, 75, who had, who had said, before the, the, the rooster crows, you will deny me um, three times. Unstable, so went, Pastor. Excellent. So he went more than he wept. So it shows the level of unstableness. Mm -hmm. um, um, Christ who is a rock. Excellent. Christ who is a rock. A rock comes out the largeness, its form, it not moving, it is stable. And Christ is building upon his. That means him. The church, church is upon Christ, not upon Peter. But the question goes on um, to speak about the keys of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to go to the keys? Okay. But let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. the, the leadership of the church, so you're basically saying it was not changed. So Christ is still the head of the church. Because one author says, had Christ given leadership of the church to somebody else in that sense, mm -hmm. then he would have named that individual before he left. True. And there would not have been any need for any kind of contention among the disciples mm -hmm. fighting for leadership, who should be the greatest and so on. Because Christ would have mm -hmm. named who the person would have been and everybody else would have just humbled themselves and obeyed what the master mm -hmm. would have said. But apparently that never happened. So it suggests that Christ never gave over leadership of his church to any earthly Anybody. being. True, true. I mean, we, we have our responsibility mm -hmm. to do what he asks of us, but in terms of who leads his church, I mean, ultimately, Christ is the head and would always remain the head. And ultimately. I, and I, and I literally, literally thank God for that. Because imagine that God would have built his church and any other person. And how, as you said, how, how sometimes fickle we are. We up today, down tomorrow. Little thing, we have a short temper. We have all of these issues that we're battling as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thankful that God didn't put his, build his church upon man. Mm -hmm. But he himself, that is Christ, built it up upon himself with the rock. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful for that. All Pastor. right, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So Pastor Palmer is just wanting to get to that whole aspect of the keys to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you have keys, you have access, Pastor. Trust me. Right. So tell <laughs> us about <laughs> keys and access. You know, um, Pastor, if you have the key, then you have access, you have, you have full control. Okay. I'm speaking about the kingdom, the, ki the, the, the kingdom of man, mm -hmm. the kingdom of who? The, the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And on, on the, uh, you know, linking on the text, mm -hmm. you just mentioned that, that, that the, for the foundation is Christ, the church, the, that is his kingdom, mm -hmm. right? It's Christ. Um, the keys to the kingdom, um, it, if you have a key to a door, you have access to the door. Because you have the key to the door. Mm -hmm. But um, man but man have control who, who enters in. But it's God who has control who, who enters in. Okay. So, so to explain the keys here, mm -hmm. um, we have to look at it in terms of in this context. It's speaking here about spiritual endowment, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, of course, of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so Christ is endowing as Peter, as, as all his followers, mm -hmm. the body of Christ. Okay. He's giving them mm -hmm. um, 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 the, the gospel. That's, that's the key. When we have the gospel, so we can preach to others, um, there's an access. The, the, the gospel is an access. There's a power of the gospel. That, to, um, what we have to help someone come to know Christ so that they can enter into the kingdom. We cannot say who will enter in or not. Some churches believe that they have the right and the power to see who will enter into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. But it's not so. Um, we just have a role as a key with the gospel to the Holy Spirit that we have been powered mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit by the gospel to tell others. So the, so the gospel is the key. 
when we hear it, we get light, we get, we get, on, we know we get a, a fresh new start in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so then we have access to his kingdom um, through, surren through repentance, through surrendering, through baptism, and living a good Christian life. So um, Peter here, Christ is endowing not only Peter, but all of us with the key to the gospel mm -hmm. to tell others, so to help someone else come to know, to know Christ. Okay, very nice. Pastor Pancho, you want to add anything to that? Um, again, I think as Pastor Palmer made the point, you know, we, it, it underlies how important that is, um, the understanding of the keys, mm -hmm. because it's not about a particular utterance that we could give, but it's a does said the Lord. Okay. So if somebody, let's say, is demon-possessed, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it is not anything particularly that the person says in a particular way, not the semantics or so. You know what, I, I repeat this word, I decree and I declare. Mm -hmm. That doesn't give power. Mm -hmm. What gives power is the does said the Lord. And so the keys to the kingdom, you know, just to, to amplify it once again, mm -hmm. is literally the gospel. Amen. Okay. Amen. That is the key. Mm -hmm. And when you tell a man, accept Jesus and be saved, the power is in that word, that that person who accepts Jesus, who is the word, will be saved. And it's not a power that we have innately of ourselves, whereby we could save anybody or we could dismiss anybody from the kingdom. But the keys to that kingdom, that power that Christ had, that he could look to the blind and, and open eyes or to the cripple and make them walk. I even speak into the dead, the, the dead cave of Lazarus, and Lala's God power is the power of the gospel. And that is the keys of the kingdom. All right. Very nice. So we have access to heaven through Jesus Christ, through his words. When we understand who he is and what he expects of us, mm -hmm. and we do accordingly as the Holy Spirit empowers us, then we have that privilege and opportunity to be surrendered, submitted, and, of course, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when the roll is called up yonder, we will be there. Amen. All right, at this time, we are going to take a short break, and we're going to take a few ads, and we'll get back to you as it relates to building a thriving church. So let's break for an ad or two. From the Youth Department of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists is the Festival of the Arts in an explosion of praise. Join the excitement as talents from across the island are displayed in music, drama, poetry, instrumentals, and the arts. Every district will be represented in this flamboyant symphony of praise. Festival of the Arts. Don't miss it. Life Department of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists presents GPS God Powered Singles. We are inviting all SDA singles throughout Grenada to join us at the Spice Basket on September 10th, 2022 at 9 a.m. It will be a grand experience as you learn how to maximize your single season, start healthy relationships, and partake in our Get to Know You session. You can't afford to miss this. See you there. Stop and pray. Members, leaders, and prayer intercessors, join the prayer ministries of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists for our annual prayer motorcade on Sabbath, 24th September from 9 a.m. The motorcade starts from Shantimal Junction and continues to Marley Junction in Sotez. We break for lunch at the McDonald College and resume the motorcade to Rose Hill, Montreach, and end at Hermitage, all at the historic parish of St. Patrick's. Come with hearts concentrated as we lift the name of Jesus and be blessed with lovely singing, powerful preaching, literature distribution, and fervent intercessory prayers. Remember, it will be a DSAP experience. Drive, stop, and pray. Join us with your buses, cars, and vans as we journey through St. Patrick's in gospel ministry, stopping at every point for concentrated periods of ministry, evangelism, and intercession. It will be spiritually impactful. Let's be there. Gospel Explosion is coming. Join the youth of the Grenada Conference of Seventh-day Adventists from Sunday, October 9th at 7 p.m. 
for an electrifying evangelistic experience like no other. Come hear the ever exhilarating Pastor Oliver Scott shatter the kingdom of darkness with thundering messages from the Word of God. If we have never needed the Lord before, we sure do need Him now. Come, find hope in the midst of your pain. We say welcome back to Pastor's Corner, where we are discussing building a thriving church. So if you have a church, or you are part of a congregation, part of the brotherhood, sisterhood of believers, then you would want to hear what we have to say coming up. And so that question is, what are the characteristics of a thriving church? In other words, how do you know that your church is looking good and doing good? Well, um, you're speaking about church and growth and body of Christ. So the question asking in terms of, well, you know, what are some of the, you know, how can you tell that a church is really, you know, thriving, is really growing? Mm -hmm. um, there are many different things that you can, ask, you can link uh, um, um, to that. But I will try and focus on, on some, some key ones, you know, t um, to me, for instance, um, you have to have strong leadership in a church. Mm -hmm. That is a good factor to know that the church is growing strong leadership because the leadership, it helps to keep the church together. It, it helps to maintain um, 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 the doctrine because they, they use the word of God and it, it guiding the young people, mm -hmm. you know, good leaders guiding them so that they can um, develop into, I mean, better Christians. And not even the young ones, but the senior ones too, who may not be so versed in the word of God. So, our leader, so the leadership will guide of course, Christ is the shepherd. He's a key leader mm -hmm. that, guides the church, that guides along the church. If a church had to grow, as Christ must be the shepherd. So if a church not having Christ as a shepherd, that's, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, also, the church, church has to be active in the local community. Of course, there can be missionary work too, but um, you know that it's good when a church is active. They know there is um, give me a food basket and hampers and no, you know, back to school supplies. So the church seeing you, they see you, is, is, you know, they, are, they are visible. Mm -hmm. So that they seeing you, they know that you are there in the community with the believers. And just okay. to give you um, one quick, quick one, um, the church will grow by making disciples. The Bible gives us in Matthew um, 28, 18, 19, and 20, mm -hmm. um, in light of goal, food, and you know, make disciples, teach and baptize and make, you have to be, you know, making disciples. Mm -hmm as you demonstrate um, area of growth. So as you make disciples, you are doing Bible reading, you are preaching, you are praying, you are growing in Christ Jesus. Okay, very nice. Um, we, earlier on we mentioned the aspect of the ecclesia, which is the church, um, and its mission. Okay. And a striving church also must be mission-oriented. Mm -hmm. What is the mission? To tell the world of Christ. So a striving church, um, you know, and again, just echoing what Pastor Farmer said, you know, the presence of God must be there. You must know, you know, it's, it's unquestionable because there is love, there is care, um, there is forgiveness. That community itself of believers share characteristics that is beyond, like let's say you have a sports club. Mm -hmm. It's beyond that. And we just looked at the keys of the kingdom. Imagine that you have the keys of the kingdom, which is the word of God. Mm -hmm. It means that you could break up any stronghold. You know, whether it's a physical ailment, whether it's a, a family issue, whether it's a money issue, whether it's a health issue, Within this community of believers, in a striving church, you're going to find that there is always healing. And people often say, well, well, pastor, I don't find all it doesn't have deliverance services or anointing services okay. or healing services. Okay. But the truth is that those aspects of, of, of healing and those aspects of deliverance is not a show. It is not you coming and the pastor lay hand on you and you fall down mm. in our feet, you know, and you say, okay, well, I was slain in the spirit. But it's a deeper transformation of your life whereby you understand that I pray to God to heal me of this particular ailment according to his will. So he may not heal me, but what he does, he gives me peace. Mm -hmm. And he gave me the assurance that he has never left me and he will never forsake me. Mm -hmm. So I bear my crucible, as we, you know, we have been studying recently, mm -hmm. with, a, with a certain level of ease and understanding, because now I've cast all my cares upon him. Mm -hmm. So the striving church is, is that community where 
that presence of God, the presence of his word, the presence of his love. And again, as Pastor Obama said earlier, service is also a key part of it. And I think that it's undeniable that whenever the presence of God is there, then the church will always be strengthened. All right. Very nice. And of course, when it comes to church growth, it could either be qualitative or quantitative. Maybe you have achieved your quantitative and now you're working on your qualitative or you, you're working on your, your quantitative. You have your, your qualities that you want to instill within the body of Christ. And so you're working on building numbers, of course, we are kingdom builders here to build up the kingdom of God, and that is by sharing knowledge and reaching persons for Jesus Christ. So Amen. if your church has plateaued, of course, churches can plateau, meaning that you have reached to a place where nothing, nothing, nothing new is happening, that is just there, then it's possible that your church can die. And you may say, is that, is that even a reality? Of course. Look around. There are churches that have closed down because, yes, there was no growth. And so it would have plateaued. And then if no drastic measures were taken, then death would have been the result. So even today, as we look at our congregations, that is something that we have to take into consideration in terms of our qualitative and quantitative growth because it would spell whether or not we are actually fulfilling our mission, especially as Seventh-day Adventists. All right. What about this question here? Does the Bible provide any guidance as to how to build and grow a fruitful congregation? Uh, the Word of God is our, like a map, our guide to help us. So, of course, the Bible will give guidelines how to build and grow. Mm -hmm. It may not be itemized, this one, one item, one, two, three. But when you, when you peruse the, the Word of God, when you, when you examine the Word of God, mm -hmm. you get an evidence from here and there that will help you to know well how to build and how to grow a fruitful church. All right. um, there are some pointers you know, that we can look at as, 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 as being fruitful from the Bible, prayer, fasting, teaching, reaching, nurturing, discipleship. I'll give you some text, two texts, just to um, back up um, some of these points. Mm -hmm. But um, the Bible speaks about teaching, mm -hmm. speaks about reaching others. Christ reach others, you know, like um, you wish the, as I normally say at times, you wish the beggar man, the rich man, the poor man, the thief. He reached them, you know, um, 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 the lame, the sick, the man possess, um, you know, those who was, you know, have all kind of problems and ailments, like Christ regime. So, nurture. Mm -hmm. There's a text, Mark, Mark 6 and verse 34, it says, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion, mm -hmm. right? Um, fruitfulness, so, you know, what, what guidance? A church have to have compassion. Move with compassion toward them because they were sh as sheep not having a, a shepherd. And he began to, this is the key here, he began to teach them many things. All right. So um, there's a guidance as you build. You have to teach them many things, not just one aspect, but the whole Bible. And, and, and there's another text, the book of Acts. Acts is a, a wonderful book that um, gives us evidence of, of, of how to uh, the church grow. Yes. Acts chapter, chapter 2, my last text, and verse 42, it says here, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So getting examples here, at the church to be fruitful and grow, there should be fellowship, um, the good doctrine. There should be, you know, um, as the Bible said, breaking of bread and prayers. Prayers is key as the church grows. So there's evidence in the Bible what we can apply um, to have a wonderful church. All right. And pastor, they say, well, they say fellowship and they say swallowship, you know. So... <laughs> You have to come together to praise them. God and amen, then you have to come together to enjoy yourself. <laughs> praise the Jesus Lord. Name. All right, for fun and social activities. I guess nothing is wrong when the people of God come together and without the jacket and tie and they could have a good time in Jesus' name because we're all social beings also. Amen. All right. And one of the aspects I'm also looking at here is that coming out of the pandemic, um, there is a greater need um, that we preserve you know, those elements in terms of helping the church to strive. Um, one of the things that we have seen and, of course, um, observe is that there are many who have yet to return to their various congregations. 
And again, some will say that they are worshiping online. Mm -hmm. Some will say that, you know, they, they're not ready to come out as yet. But um, when we consider um, the ecclesia, that the church itself, again, we're saying that it's more expansive than the physical building, but there's also a requirement for more, us individually. Okay. Because we are witnesses, mm -hmm. and we are re re witnesses of the redemptive work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we cannot be witnesses if we light our candle and put it under a bushel. Okay. We can't cover down our light and, and, and still want it to shine. Okay. And so the only how our lives to be shine, we have to be seen. Mm -hmm. The church has to be visible. Okay. And so the only how to be visible is to also have service. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that service I'm talking about is not the, the, the handing out of the, the food stuff, uh, the food baskets, and also the handing out of the, um, you know, the, 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 the shoes and the school bags and those various aspects, mm -hmm. which we also do. But service itself of keeping the church doors open. Okay. Because the church door stands as a witness to everyone who passes by. Okay. And so sometimes a church might find, well, the attendance is not great or the community is not regular at service. And they may feel that they're not fulfilling a function. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that every time the church door is open, whether it's on a, um, a Sabbath day or a Sunday night service or Wednesday night service, it stands as a witness to those around. So that the thirsty traveler, the person who is losing hope, the person who, who is looking for answers, at that point in time, once the church door is open, have an opportunity to come to Christ to the simple act of having the church doors open. And so I think a, a striving church and one that represents the kingdom of God must keep its doors open. Also. All right. Okay, very nice. And of course, during COVID, the open door wasn't the literal open door again. Yes, yes. I mean, we had to find other methods and mm -hmm. avenues by which we could get the word out, not just to all people alone, but yes. everybody else that had a thirst mm -hmm. and a wanting for the word of God during that period. And thank God mm -hmm. he provided the, the online means. Thank God for technology and mm -hmm. for the internet and the mm -hmm. World Wide Web. And we also say thank you for your contributions that you have been making towards mm -hmm. these programs so that we can continue by the grace of God your offerings are indeed appreciated and welcome, and we encourage you to give in the service of God so that other persons can also find hope in the midst of darkness. Amen. As we come closer to the end, yes, closer to the end, we come to this beautiful question. What does it mean that the church is the bride of of Christ. Now, that, that's interesting because the Bible says, for I am jealous. So, we're talking about 2 Corinthians 11, 2. It says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. How beautiful. Well, the text as the word that the term say, mm -hmm. the church is a bride of Christ. All right. For those um, who have that experience mm -hmm. in terms of the bride, okay. when you in that position that the person is central to your eyes. Okay, okay. The person All is right. close to you. All right. <laughs> you know, you, you, you are in constant contact with the person. Okay. You care for the person. <laughs> so I the see. text is saying here that the church <laughs> is the bride of Christ. Yeah. Um, there, are, there, there are examples from the word of God. I read one earlier. We, we read one earlier from First Peter 2.9. Okay. But he had chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar mm -hmm. people that he should for the, the presence of God, of him, mm -hmm. who called you out of darkness in this marvelous light. Correct. So, so, so the text is saying that God sees the church as special, as peculiar, mm -hmm. um, as the apple of his eye, you know, mm -hmm. always in view. Mm -hmm. Then the, in the book of Revelation, mm -hmm. um, you look at chapter 1 and 2, you can scan it, that it speaks about the, 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 the candlesticks and, you know, and, 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 and God himself among the church. So he's not away from the church. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, some have the idea that God just, the church there and he gone, or he made the earth and he gone. No, 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 no. A bride um, to Christ is always close by. You don't want to have a bride and, 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 and she, you know, like male thinking, male, she's gone some far away and not close to you. Uh, the bride should be close to you. You notice <laughs> the, the sense of, of, 
of importance. Amen, amen, amen. He's placing an emphasis that he's placing on, on those points here. I found that a change in his demeanor as we got to this part of We're the, giving the clarity question. to the text. Okay, okay. Go, ahead, pastor. Go ahead, So I, 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 I paused for a while and I just see him that um, just shows that the bride is special in his sight. Okay. Amen? Okay. So we must be a part of the church of God so Christ can have that specialness. Because let me bring it home to us now that yes, the church, but we are part of that church called out and God wants to have us in his view at all times. Because there's an enemy trying to take us out but God have our back and, he, and he's watching over Amen. us. All right. Very Amen. Nice. Amen. And again, it's so powerful that God love is, is what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as, you know, Sister White says that the church itself is a God's appointed agency for the salvation of man. Mm -hmm. And so imagine that you have the love of God, which is so great that it has um, shined to all men. Mm -hmm. And God has to entrust that work to his church. All right. That, that's why he's guarded so jealously, as the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Because he don't want us to come with corrupt doctrine or corrupt mm -hmm. teachings. Mm -hmm. He don't Very want nice. us to come because man cannot be saved through corrupt doctrine. Mm -hmm. The only man, way man can be saved is through the truth of God's word. Very nice. And that's why it's so important that Christ himself holds his church in such high regard. Amen. And that's why he said that not, not, not one daughter, one title shall be removed from his word. Because he knows that the church of Christ is built upon that same word, which is Jesus Christ himself. Yeah, and so we nice. just have to keep, you know, <laughs> pressing on. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Pam, I have something <laughs> burning to add. So I'll just allow him to do just that. <laughs> I, 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 Pastor Pantry, your point is, is, is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah, when yeah, you yeah. said, when we say bride, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the doctrine, Christ making sure purity, purity that the purity of the doctrine, yeah, yeah. you know, nobody come and, and yeah. infiltrate that. Mm -hmm. You, you know, is a, is, a, is, a, is a oneness, is a, is a love, is a unity. Mm -hmm. So Christ guarding the doctrine of the church. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes there are persons out there, they, they, they are wolf in sheep, clothing, and they come in all kind of false concepts and doctrine. So mm -hmm. Christ making sure that his eyes is upon his bride, his church. Amen. All right, Amen. very nice, Pastor Palmer. Very nice. How does unity impact the body of Christ? How does unity impact the body of Christ? I'm gonna, I'll go back to an earlier part of our discussion mm -hmm. um, that where we said that, you know, and I'm going to take the part, the first part, and Pastor Pam will take the, another, the next part. Mm -hmm. unit, this unity among Christians, I'm talking about in the general sense, um, you have Pentecostal, you have Baptists, you have Roman Catholics, you have Seventh-day Adventists, you have Methodists, and Anglican, and so, so many other um, um, variations of the Christian belief under that umbrella of Christianity. And, and persons are looking on and they're saying, but if you have a Bible, why you have all of these various beliefs under the banner of Christianity? And so that sometimes keeps people away. Because the time they get to understand who Jesus is, mm -hmm. they look at that disunity and they say, well, you all can believe in the same Bible, in the same God, and have so many different teachings. Okay. So once this disunity itself causes many persons to lose sight of Christ, because they see all of these various beliefs under the banner of Christianity. Christianity, so it does negatively affect the spreading of the gospel. All right, very nice. Um, wonderful. Um, because when, he, as Pastor said, when you have this unity with the gospel message and everybody have their own concept and their own ideas, and these days, truth becomes something that, you know, I have truth, you have truth, everybody have truth, and my truth is good, your own is good, and no, nobody wrong, but um, that could have a level of this, this unity. That could affect, affect the body of Christ. Okay. So this unity in light of, as, as Pastor Pantry said, the gospel in terms of what, what, you, what you read that could cause. So some of the effects, um, you could have stagnation within the body of Christ. Okay. Once you have this unity, you could have discord among, you know, like all you have is about growth. You will not be growing. You will be more on a stage of declining. Mm -hmm. um, then you will change your aspect on how the, how the community views the church. You see, when we have w all things in common and in, and in oneness and that unity, it, it, will impa it should impact the church in a positive manner. So like the people in the, com in the community, that they will see the church as, as a true light bearer. They will see love and unity coming out from, from there. So that is key. Um, it can impact the church. Um, when we not, be, of course, it, in anything, where there's more unity, there could be a lot of problems and discord, which God would not. But, but it, it come back to... To the, to the evil one. He's a mastermind behind that. Mm -hmm. 
trying to create a lot of discord. And it, it happened with him, you know, in heaven. And he was thrown out with others. Mm -hmm. So in Christ, um, you can gain a lot and have unity. All yeah. right, very nice. And of course, there's a perfect example when it comes to unity and uh, disunity with the Tower of Babel. True. When mm -hmm. they were in one accord and they knew what they wanted to accomplish. They were building and building and building. They were establishing an earthly kingdom of glory and honor to themselves. And Christ saw it differently. That was not the purpose that he placed them there for. They were to disperse themselves and to make Christ known to the, the other places around and to establish themselves around and so on. But they thought it different, yeah. to do differently. And so Christ confirmed their language. And so all the progress that they were making, it was inhibited, it was prevented, it was stopped, it was halted. And so when we have this unity, then the progress and the success that we are supposed to have, we will not have it. And that is why Satan wants to put a check on God's work. Mercy. Mm -hmm. So that he can hinder mm -hmm. the amount of persons mm -hmm. that surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Because that is what it's all about who surrenders and who doesn't surrender. And so that is why we have to take the work so seriously and ensure that we do our part. We keep the word of God pure and true. We do not seek to infiltrate and we do not seek to dilute it in any way, but we give it thus see it, the word of God as the Spirit leads us so that men and women can have an understanding of who Jesus is and make that decision to follow him all the way. Amen. Well, final question today what is the greatest need of the church? And we're speaking about in a today's context. Um, briefly, I'll just say here, mm -hmm. there could be many different needs. Dharma not be the greatest one, but it's come to mind. To mind uh, a Holy Spirit consecrated person. Heart that is Holy Spirit driven. And consecrated. Let me just take a text. March 22, 22 was 37. Um, Holy Spirit consecrated hearts for God. March 22 and verse 37 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That's what the church needs to be. Amen. And I'll just add also that. You know, it's rather interesting that now that we are in the last days, at any time Jesus could come and the church is faced with so much issues. Um, one, in the aspect of its mission, um, you, you, as you, make, um, you hinted to it that when the word of God is being preached, sometimes people tend to be resolved in how it's preached because you don't want to offend anybody. You talk about uh, trying to be politically correct. Um, when it comes to, to other aspects uh, we mentioned earlier, disunity and all of those aspects. But I think the same blueprint that Christ used is the same one that's going to be effective now. That wherever Christ go, his interest was in, in the people that he served. He wanted, and he, he, um, he, he wanted and he provided for the good. And so he gave service, and not only did he give service, but he was also a witness to the love of God. And I think wherever we go, um, Sister Stephen said, love I think love itself could, could summarize it. Mm -hmm. That the love of Christ that was shed abroad before is that is the same thing that we have to shed abroad in the hearts of everyone now. So that as Christ transforms us and we taste of his love, that we share that same love with others and they too when they see the love of Christ, that by the grace of God that they surrender their life to him. And so we must, the secret to it boils down back to our service to men and of course firstly our service to God. Wonderful. And of course, revival godliness within the people of God. Mm -hmm. And if there is revival, then there must be reformation. All right, we say thank you today to our mm -hmm. pastors for their presence and also the contributions that you have made to the topic building a thriving church. And we say thank you also to our online audience. You have been with us and we appreciate that very much. And we say thank you. Join us also this evening at 8 p.m. for our rebroadcast so that just in case you didn't get everything, you can get it a little later on. At this time, Pastor Palmer would close us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you again that you have given us um, this, this 
this chance, this time where we can discuss your word and look at the church as we did today in terms of growth and aspects of involving growth. And Lord, we pray for those out there who would have heard, who would have viewed, that their hearts will be touched. They will have, you know, get a clearer understanding of something so that they can grow, grow stronger in you. And as I said, the, the, oh God, may love be the theme of our life. Um, you know, it's a need. You know, many out there, they are suffering. So Lord, we pray, oh God, that, you know, help um, hearts to be full of love so others can come to know you, the risen Savior. So thank you again. Bless us all. Keep us safe. Give us the strength that we so in need of. And may all of us, um, through surrendering, um, gain life everlasting. This we pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 God bless you until we meet again.